Let us stand and sing Marcia's favorite song, <laughs> Shine, Jesus, Shine, as we welcome the light of Christ into our midst. you to come forward at this time and have a chat with me. Good morning. It's great to see you guys up here. It's been a little while since I've seen everybody. So much sickness and yucky going around. We're glad that you're here this morning. Today is Transfiguration Sunday. 
Now that's a big word, transfiguration. Something cool though, right? Something had to happen. So Jesus takes some of his closest friends and they go up the mountain. And when they're up on the mountain, looking all over, it's so cool, great sights, all of a sudden Jesus shines. His clothes turn dazzling white, whiter than my robe, that it blinds them. And they were just wishing they had a pair of those with them. You know, have you ever tried to look at the sun? You shouldn't do that. But if you do, you can't, can you? Without, you know, sunglasses, you know, especially when you're driving, right? You need your sunglasses. Otherwise, well, you're not driving, but when I'm driving, I need my sunglasses sometimes. You aren't, you aren't driving, are you? Window. Yeah, it's when you look out the window, that's right. I'm driving, you're looking out the window. And you see the light, you can't quite look at it so bright. Well, that's what happened when the disciples and Jesus are up on the mountain on this Transfiguration Sunday. It's so bright, they wish they had sunglasses. They bowed down, they couldn't look, it was so bright. You know, Jesus was, I think, you know, God was trying to get everyone's attention. You know, in school... Sometimes everybody is talking all the same time and everybody's trying to talk over the teacher. What will the teacher do? Well, sometimes. So rap on the table, right? Or you have some sort of... When I was going to school, we, the principal was Mr. Conley at the Phelps Elementary School. And he had a thing we'd go, one, two, three, and then we had to repeat that, right? And then we would do it back and we'd all quiet down. If you're in court, you know, and if people are talking, you have a judge up there, right? What's he do to get your attention? He, he has a gavel, right? He, he bangs it on his desk, gets everybody's attention. So God was trying to get everyone's attention. He would, this bright light, you couldn't ignore it. It was there for everybody to see. And so he wanted, the point, the message that he wanted everybody to hear was that this is Jesus. We're up here with Jesus. And Jesus wants us to listen to him. And that's a really important teaching. And so he needed to get our attention. He's getting our attention this morning to remind us that we are to listen to Jesus, the very one who gave us the commandment to love God and to love our neighbor. And so in everything we do, we have to listen to Jesus as we live out our life, trying to love everyone, trying to treat everyone with kindness. And if we do that, the world will be a transformed place. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for Transfiguration Sunday. Thank you for that bright light in your dazzling white clothes that cause us to draw attention to you, that we might listen to you and pattern our lives after you. Lord, we ask for your blessing to be upon our children this morning as they seek to listen to your voice in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you can go to nursery or go back to your seats. This morning is our release. gather now before our shining Savior to confess our sins that we might be forgiven. Let us pray together our confession. Loving Jesus, one with our living God, we confess that we have tried to put you in a box. We have tried to make understanding you and your ways simple and easy for us and difficult for others. We have set burdens upon others that we do not bear ourselves. We have attributed wealth and worldly success as blessings from you, contrary to your teaching. We have determined that serving our own interests best serves you, because we have mistaken worldly happiness for the joy that your love brings. Forgive us 
call us away from the temptations of the world to put you in a box and instead break open in us your ways of love, forgiveness, mercy, and justice. In your name we pray. Amen. There's no mountain too high, no valley too low for God to find us. There is no limit on grace or forgiveness, and God's steadfast love is unmeasurable. Know that you are beloved by God, forgiven and restored. Brothers and sisters, hear these words. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear God and place their hope in God's steadfast love. When we turn to God and place our hope in the Lord, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning. Our first reading today is 2 Kings 2, verses 1 through 12. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were traveling from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to Bethel. But Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The group of prophets from Beth Bethel came to Elisha and asked him, Did you know the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? Of course I know, Elisha answered, but be quiet about it. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to Jericho. But Elisha replied again, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went on together to Jericho. Then the group of prophets from Jericho came to Elisha and asked him, Did you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? Of course I know, Elisha answered, but be quiet about it. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here. For the Lord has told me to go to the Jordan River. But again, Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went on together. Fifty men from the group of prophets also went and watched from a distance as Elijah and Elisha stopped beside the Jordan River. Then Elijah folded his cloak together and struck the water with it. The river divided, and the two of them went across on dry ground. When they came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I can do for you before I am taken away. And Elisha replied, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit and become your successor. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah replied. If you see me when I am taken from you, then you will get your request, but if not, then you won't. As they were talk, walking along and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared, drawn by horses on fire, of fire. It drove between the two men, separating them, and Elijah was carried by a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father! I see the chariots and charioteers of Israel. And as they disappeared from sight, Elisha tore his clothes in distress. The second reading is Psalm 50, verses 1 through 6. The Lord, the Mighty One, is God, and he has spoken. He has summoned all humanity from where the sun rises to where it sets. 
From Mount Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines in glorious radiance. Our God approaches, and he is not silent. Fire devours everything in his way, and a great storm rages around him. He calls on the heavens above and earth below to witness the judgment of his people. Bring my faithful people to me, those who made a covenant with me by giving sacrifices. Then let the heavens proclaim his justice, for God himself will be the judge. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. turn and greet one another with the peace and love of Jesus Christ. And I remind you in this flu and yucky season, the peace sign is fine to use.
Sometimes you have to refuse to turn back in order to receive God's blessings. Sometimes you have to give from a position of faith in order to see the fruit of faith spring forth. In our living and in our giving, let us follow the example of those who followed faithfully until the very end. Let us receive this morning's offering. pray together our blessing. Light of light, when we grow accustomed to dwelling in the shadows and painting with drab colors, you bless us with your radiance and the vitality of your love. Illumine these gifts, Holy One, that the world may see your light shining through our offering. Illumine our very lives, O God, that we may remain restless until we shine like Christ upon the mountain, and behold your glory. Amen. Like last week, we had 40. Uh, this week, we have one. So I guess our prayers are working. 
That's what that tells me. I'm going to assume that anyways. Uh, and we have a joy this morning. Bill Copper is off oxygen. Continued prayers for rehab of his left knee. He is making progress daily. And we have an address and we'll be able to get a card off to him at the Living Center in Geneva. So we praise God for the progress that he's making. Uh, there are announcements and you can read them in your insert this morning. There's an organizational meeting beginning at 6.15 on Tuesday, um, preceding the leadership meeting at 7 o'clock. Our prayer vigil begins um, on Wednesday, uh, midnight, and it goes through the end of Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday supper, pancake supper, is at 6 p.m. All are welcome to come. And immediately following at 6.45, we will have a service with imposition of ashes right here in the sanctuary. So I trust that you'll make every attempt to be here for that. Next Sunday, the newsletter deadline uh, is uh, the deadline. Uh, next Sunday. Uh, scholarship applications are due Monday, February 26th. So that's coming up quickly. We are offering, Sherry Abel is offering, one of our new members, offering a children's writers group. And so if you are interested in starting up uh, this group, or your kids would like to be a part of this, uh, please talk to Sherry uh, after church or talk to me. I'll get you in touch with her. Uh, just a wonderful way for our kids to be creative and uh, use their God-given gifts in that way. So great opportunity. We have a chicken barbecue coming up on March 4th and tickets are on sale. They're $10, and so you can see Marsha uh, this morning, and you can pick them up, or of course, in the office as well. A reminder about the ecumenical Lenten services. They're going to be Wednesday evenings, beginning the Wednesday following Ash Wednesday. We're going to start at the Shortsville Presbyterian Church and make our way east, ending here at our church each week. So we'll go from Shortsville to Clifton Methodist to Clifton Baptist, St. John's Episcopal, and we'll end with us. All the services start at 6.30. We'll be sharing communion together at each of these services. So this should really draw us together into a holy Lent. And we will certainly be spiritually prepared to welcome in um, with our celebrations Easter morning. So I hope you'll come. 6.30, uh, refreshments to follow. The pastors are swapping pulpits, so you won't know where we are week to week. So I encourage you to come. Those are the announcements that we have. Joys, others? Linda? Yeah. Um, I can't uh, uh, promote the ecumenical theme. Um, Family Promise of Ontario County is having their comfort food book And we're raising funds. Family Promise is um, a program that we're going to start in the fall. And it's ideally that helps the children who are homeless and their families. Um, what we find is children go to many schools in the course of the school year. This program is designed to help them stay in one place, you know, and, and be provided uh, an education for the full year, you know, for one school. And also help the families. Um, it's all about homelessness where, you know, you go live a couple of weeks with Aunt Jerry and then you go live with Uncle Fred over here. And so the kids are constantly being moved around. So Family Promise is about trying to um, support those families in Ontario County. And one of the major fundraisers is this uh, Comfort Food Club. The way that works is uh, for $10, you can go in the door, and uh, we have the latches still <coughs> providing us with sample food. So you'll go to different stations and sample food, and there'll be a bucket in front of them. You're really like there is you put in a couple extra bucks. So it's a it's a it's a fundraiser to uh, you know get this program on. So I have tickets, uh, ten dollars a piece. It's going to be March third at the Methodist Church in Clifton Springs, and it goes from three to five thirty. So there'll be winners. Uh, whoever has the most money in their bucket wins. Mm -hmm. But then also we're going to ask the uh, clergy in the community to be the expert uh, chef tasters who will then also award an enterprise. So, <laughs> so it's really going to be a fun community event. I get 10 hours for ticket and we'd love to have it. One of those days you just hate your job, you know? <laughs> it's tough. It's a tough one. Now please, please see Linda and, and pick up your ticket. Ten dollars is for a really, really good program and ministry that we can really, this is tangible folks, we can really put legs and feet to the gospel with this program. So, exciting. Thank you, Linda. Janet? Um, praying for the cancer, cancer, and Florida. Yes, uh, I don't know if you know Mid-Lakes uh, 
band was all down to Disney and they're performing and they haven't been able to get home. So they're still in Florida. We got an update though. So what are we praying for? I'm not sure. We're gonna find out. We're gonna we're gonna ask we're gonna we're, we're gonna ask one of the parents. They're coming back today. Oh. They're staying in a five-star hotel over this layover. They're going to Tampa later today, but they're coming back tomorrow. Okay, they're coming back tomorrow. That's the word. So pray for their continued safety and that uh, they have a lot of fun and uh, too much sunburn. Okay, okay. All right. Yeah, we're not feeling too bad for them really, but and they get Monday off now from school. On top of it all, so pretty good deal. What else? Okay. Let us pray. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Almighty God, we are privileged to be able to come and to worship you so freely, to come before you and lift our praises, hear your word proclaimed, to be inspired to be a light that shines in this world with your love and your grace and your forgiveness. For we are a forgiven and reconciled people because of your sacrifice in your Son, Jesus. We can know forgiveness, we can know grace that abounds, and we can know life that is abundant and everlasting. Lord, we admit that there are days that our lights don't shine awfully brightly. And for that, we ask for your forgiveness. And we know that your grace is available. So we thank you that we have the opportunity each and every day. Your mercies are new. Each and every day, we can let our light shine. Try and try again when we fall down and fall short. God, we thank you for the opportunity to come and be a community of faith together in this place, to laugh together, cry together, to share each other's journeys, to bring to you our prayers. And we lift to you Bill Copper as he continues to recover from his knee replacement. It's good news that he is doing well and is on his way home. We ask, Lord, that he will be able to come home soon and get back to normal. We ask for your safety and comfort for our students who are quote-unquote stuck in Florida. Uh, Lord, we pray though that they are safe and they can be home again with their families come Monday. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to serve and be disciples of yours and seek out those who need your love, grace, a place to call home for a period of time. Opportunities like Family Promise are, are presenting themselves. So help us to embrace the opportunity and let our light shine. Lord, hear our prayers this day. In the name of Jesus, the very one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We continue our lessons from the Gospel according to Mark. We're jumping a few chapters to chapter 9, uh, beginning with the second verse. This is the story of the Transfiguration. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. 
as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I read the Bible, especially when I'm in study mode or sermon preparing mode, I'm always asking myself some questions. What's the point that the author's trying to make here? Why did the author use this word or that word? Why recount the story at all? Why tell it this way? Why tell it here in the midst of this particular context, whatever's going on around the story? There are faith traditions um, out there that claim that their sacred texts were recited by God directly into the ear of a listening person who then transcribed what was heard word for word. There are other faiths that are out there that teach that their sacred texts came down from heaven directly written by God. Now, Judaism and Christianity have never really taught that. And as Methodists and as Presbyterians, we are, of course, a little all over the map as to how we understand, approach, and read and interpret the scriptures. But in general, we believe that the Holy Scripture is the, and I quote, rule of faith and life, and that it is the basic principle of the Reformation. Now, we accept the scriptures of the Old and the New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative, very important, authoritative witness to Jesus Christ. That doctrine of authority focuses then on the whole Bible, the Bible as a whole, rather than any particular text. So, in, with regards to topics like, let's say, healings or other big ones, inclusiveness or final judgment, this doctrine of authority prompts us to ask questions. What are all the verses that talk about whatever this is, the topic is? How do they fit together to form one cohesive biblical teaching? And then how is it that we follow that teaching and live it out in our lives? I've always appreciated what the Reverend Lillian Daniels, she's an ordained United Church of Christ pastor, and she says, well, I, and I'm quoting here, well, we believe that there are rich expressions of God's word in religions other than our own. For us as followers of Christ, the Bible is the great book above all others. It is not a God itself or an idol to be worshipped. It is God's word for us as Christians, and we are called to take it seriously. We take the Bible seriously, but not always literally. In our tradition, we take it so serious that we take the time to study. To study the social and historical context in which it was written down. For me, it all kind of boils down to this, that the scriptures should ultimately, ultimately point us to a greater love and appreciation of Jesus Christ and make our hearts desire and seek after to be Christ, to be Christ in the world. When we consider, let's say, the story of Jesus, we have not one, but we have four versions of the story, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, they all tell the, basically the same story, but with their own distinctives. And I believe that's how God wanted it to be. I believe that we can actually learn from all of them, and I believe all these stories are true and, and powerfully true. All three of what we call the synoptic gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they have our gospel lesson for today in them, the story of the transfiguration. The story is told, the story that gets told is basically the same. But a few details vary here and there. And even words like that the voice of God say from the cloud, that even varies if you read all three of the Gospels. 
Now, most scholars, as I've said time and again, believe that Mark's story was written down first and that Matthew and Luke used that story as the basis for their own and then they threw in some creative edits along the way. So when we read Mark, we have to ask ourselves, what's the point Mark's trying to make? What does this story mean for us today? And why did he tell it this way? It starts out like a good story, really. Just a regular story that anyone's going to tell. You know, maybe about a bunch of guys going on a fishing trip, or a bunch of guys going to go on a hiking trip, or a hunting trip. And it's just, it's just a normal day with some normal people. Jesus takes Peter and James and John, men who have become his inner circle, if you will, and up the mountain they go. Six days. Six days after the last recorded event where Jesus predicts his own death. So this story, the story of the transfiguration, takes place on the da 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 the seventh day, a biblical number, the number of spiritual perfection, the number that gets stamped on every work of God. So that's an interesting piece of the story. And then, of course, in the Bible, a lot of things happen up on mountains. Why? Because they are dotted all over the landscape where all of these biblical stories are being told and written down. And then, of course, there's this sense that up on a mountain, you get really close to God because God resides in heaven and heaven is, well, in the sky. Now Moses, for example, he goes up on a mountain. He goes up on Mount Sinai, right? With three named companions. Exodus 24, and God appears and speaks to all of them there. In fact, Exodus tells us that the voice of God spoke to Moses on the da 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 seventh day. Do you get the feeling that Mark is being intentional here, telling us his story in such a way that we can't help but connect the two. And then, of course, there's the cloud of glory. You know, and God comes down, covers the mountain. That sounds like Mark. A little bit later in Exodus 34, verse 8, God's voice comes over the cloud, and it says, Moses quickly bowed down toward the earth and worshipped. The similarities are pretty clear. The experience of being in God's presence is transformative. It's transformative for Moses. Exodus 34, 29, it makes his face shine. It makes his face shine so much that it made the people afraid to come near him. Now in Mark, we read that God's presence on the mountain transformed Jesus so that his clothes were dazzling white such that no one on earth could bleach them. Nothing in Mark is said about Jesus' face shining. But interestingly, both Matthew and Luke, they tell that detail of his face shining radiantly, bringing their version close to Exodus. In Mark's story, Moses himself and Elijah appear with Jesus as he is being transformed. Mark tells us that they speak together. They have a conversation. But we are not privy to that conversation. Nobody says what they talk about. What does that say to me? It says to me clearly the point must be that their presence with Jesus, just being there, is what's important. Because where did those guys come from? I mean, they both lived hundreds of years ago. They're now dead, or whatever state one is in after death, and Jesus is there with them, transformed into someone who can be at home in that state of after death ex existence. So is this then a foreshadowing of a future time in which Jesus will, have, uh, will, be, will be dead but yet is alive? I mean, OMG, there, there, there's so much going on in the story that we don't have time to unpack it this morning. But anyways, I'll get back on track. And, but we should know that, before I get back on track, that Elijah, too, had an experience of meeting God on a mountain. Remember the story? He hid in the crack in a rock as God was passing him by. After an earthquake, after a fire, Elijah met God in the sound of sheer silence. Then God spoke to him. I mean, odd things happen on mountains. Just like our transfiguration story. So, Peter. Peter is reacting. 
You know, he's getting, ex he's gotten excited about what he's seeing before him up on the mountain. He, he begins to react to everything that's happening. And Mark tells us in, in verse 5, then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let's make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Peter is nervous Nelly at this point. Right? And while he's making this suggestion about building these shrines, one for each of them. You know, so clearly he gets the whole concept. He gets the concept that Jesus too is at home in the after death world, even though he's not died yet. And certainly Peter is aware that Jesus fits within the context of the primary story of Israel, the story that includes the Exodus from Egypt the giving of the Torah at Sinai, the experience of the prophets who spoke truth to power, as Elijah did to Ahab. But the point that Peter gets wrong is exactly the climax of the story. The point he misses is the so what? So what that all this is happening? He has been moved by the glory of the sacred presence of God. He has been amazed by the luminosity of Jesus' transfiguration, but what does he think is the implication of all of this? Stay put. Hide out. Worship. Just those guys together. Build a shrine. Show devotion. And the narrator, Mark, says, well, that's all a bit of a mistake. A bit of confusion. The voice from the cloud, the voice of God is the, in this climatic moment tells them and tells us what the point of this strange story is. The voice of God says, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Yep, that sounds a lot like what Mark told us about Jesus at the beginning of the gospel, right? Very beginning, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the son of God. It sounds a lot like that voice from heaven that comes down at Jesus' baptism, right? This is my son. With him I am well pleased. He's the beloved. But this voice in the cloud in our story today takes it a step further, telling us not only who Jesus is, but adding the crucial so what? What to do about it? Listen to him. This is so powerfully clear that we easily miss it. Listen, if Jesus is God's Son, then what does that mean? So what? What does He want from us? A new pilgrimage site? A vacation destination all-inclusive? A new place for worship? High up on a mountain far, far away? Silly Peter. No! No, 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 no. None of that. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. The one single and completely clear implication for us who believe that Jesus Christ is uniquely God's son is that we are to listen to him. And in our listening, become living, breathing, red letter people of faith disciples of Jesus Christ. We have been given the mandate from God to study the Word, and the Word is Jesus. We've been given the mandate to learn from Jesus, to imitate Jesus. Jesus' life, Jesus' death, Jesus' resurrection isn't some happy ending to a beautiful fairy tale. It isn't some happy ending at the end of some film or movie, but is the result of love incarnate, love intervening, a love that wants to bring to the world hope, humility, salvation, a message of abundant life. And we've been taken up to the mountain to experience these things and then invited to come back down to share it. The whole basis, in my understanding, of our Christian theology is that Jesus shows us God. Jesus shows us what God cares about, who God cares about, 
what God does about the issues that God cares about. You see, in Jesus Christ, we see, we understand as best we can, God. Therefore, we ought to listen to Him. These words from the cloud are, as it turns out, right out of the story of Moses. And Moses himself makes a prediction in Deuteronomy chapter 18, and with it he gives this sense of duty. He said, The Lord your God will raise up a prophet like me from your community, from your fellow Israelites. He's the one that you must listen to. And it should come at no surprise to any one of us when I tell you that the Hebrew word for listen and obey are the same word. Listen, to listen is to obey. How many of you have ever watched um, The Sopranos? You know, or movies like it, you know? There are similar ones where people have a, live their life in the mafia, right? Now, those guys, they will kill, they run rackets, organize crime of all kinds, and then what do they do? They head to church, they dip their fingers in the holy water, and they cross themselves. <laughs> Is that what God wants from us? The prophet Micah instructs us well. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. This is my Son, the Beloved. Listen to him. Don't build another altar. Don't set up another vacation destination. Rather, listen to him. Build a community of justice. Build a community of mercy. Build a community with a foundation of faithful love. You see, what I really love about Mark's gospel and what his gospel brings to us is that there is so little teaching that Jesus does with his words. Think about it. There's no Sermon on the Mount. There's no Beatitudes, right? And if you read it, you'll find parables are pretty scarce. Most of what we take away, learn from Jesus, from Mark, we learn by watching what Jesus does. And in this way, we are listening to him. And so what do we see Jesus doing that we should listen to? We see him repeatedly extending compassion to people who are in pain. We see him concerned that there are people without enough to eat and getting food for them. We see Jesus stopping for people who are sick and providing health care for them. We see Jesus even willing to break through the boundaries of culture and custom to extend God's mercy to people who are in need, especially to people whom others have undervalued, like women and children, or excluded people like lepers. Jesus reaches across ethnic boundaries. He reaches out to people who are consumed by evil. On and on and on the story goes and there is no one, no one, no one who comes to Jesus who is seeking justice and seeking mercy and who wants nothing more than to be loved whom Jesus rejects or withholds justice, mercy, and love. No one. Are you in pain this morning? however you might define that? Are you suffering? 
do you need a loving, compassionate, inclusive embrace? Do you need a little shine, Jesus shine, being sung from your lips? Jesus is here for you today, doing exactly what he always does. Offering God's love and mercy to you. And for all of us, he is extending this mandate. Listen. Listen to him. Learn from him. Obey him. There is no one, no one, God in Christ Jesus does not love. No one God does not include. No one God is not willing to die for so that the cycle of violence can be stopped. What's the point? The so what? on Transfiguration Sunday. Perhaps, perhaps it's to commit ourselves to being red-letter people of faith who listen to Jesus Christ because He is God's one and only Son begotten, not made. And the place to put it into action is not up on a high mountain shrine, inaccessible, but down the mountain where there are people waiting. Shine with the light of Jesus, church. Listen. Obey. Let your little light shine. Be red letter people of faith. Be Jesus in the world. Start today. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Every day, every day, every day. To the glory of God and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand and affirm our faith together. My only comfort in life and in death is that I am not my own, but I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of evil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Amen. Let us remain standing as we sing our closing song, Jesus, Take Us to the Mountain.
And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord add his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in peace, hope, and love. Amen.